mean, the sound itself is enough to scare you, but coming, they couldn't hear it. They called it whispering death because they just knew they couldn't get away from it. It was too fast, it was too maneuverable, and before they even knew it was there, it was on them. Randy authored a book called Snake Pilot about his Vietnam experience. The book's razor-sharp detail stems from its source, audio cassettes which Randy recorded almost daily during his time in country. The tapes are cassette tapes that I say, sent my parents from Vietnam um, that they saved unbeknownst to me and gave them to me in 1981. Another member of Randy's unit, pilot Grover Wright of Vacaville, California, actually shot Super 8 home movies of the group in Vietnam. Taken together, the tapes and film make a unique record of daily life in the 1st Cavalry, 1970. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is your roving reporter, Randy Zahn, reporting to you from rotten Vietnam. Wow. Hi, Mom and Dad. I've been here in Vietnam exactly two months today. Oh, Mom, this I've got to tell you. You know the macaroni you sent me. I honestly believe we got more macaroni than any other single person in the whole country of Vietnam. Our squadron talk would have been there. The hangars would have been right here. And our, our hooch would have been just back, uh, just about south of where we are right now. Randy recalls a night in the hooch which nearly cost him his own life. March 12th, 1970, I got back um, and I went and got something to drink and I was laying in bed and um, you have to understand, Phuc Bien was a really big base. So when we took incoming, a lot of times you would hear it and say, yeah, it's on the other side of the field, you know, too bad for them. When we started getting concerned is when you'd hear the loud crack and you'd hear shrapnel and, and debris on the roof, because we had tin roofs, so you could hear it, you know, tinkle, tinkle, tinkle. It's like, yeah, it's getting pretty close. And a second one hit, and it was real close. And I don't know to this day what told me to get on the ground, but I hit the ground and they had fired a third one. Hit and it actually landed six or seven feet directly behind me. And if I had kept running, it would have just cut me in half. It would have caught me right through the torso. It would have been all over. Randy not only has pictures of that night, he has an audio tape. You're still coming. I got myself out. I got to the side bunker and I felt something. I felt a real, real, very strange sensation in my face. I, I don't know what. And I first got up and I felt some pain in my leg and I reached down and my hand was all covered in blood. And, and what I had felt in my head was I had about a three foot piece of splinter that had literally stuck in my right temple. So yeah, but the hooch, the hooch uh, burnt to the ground. I mean, there's nothing left of it. Other travelers have other missions. Not far from Phuc Vinh stood one of the principal headquarters of the infantry in Vietnam the base at Lai Kê. Veteran Robert Hernandez of Riverside, California spent two tours at Lai Kê with the famed Big Red One, the Army's first infantry division. Robert's running buddy is U.S. Marine Gunnery Sergeant Leroy Huff. They are both members of a support group from the Veterans Center in Corona, California, but they knew each other only casually before this trip. Now, this is the strip right here. On this journey, they soon become inseparable companions. Their wars had much in common, yet they will soon learn their reasons for coming back to Vietnam stand in sharp contrast. Lai Kê straddled an essential nexus of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, blocking the shortest and easiest routes by which NVA troops could reach and attack Saigon. Robert's job was repairing the vehicles and weapons damaged in battles and Viet Cong rocket barrages. Those non-stop attacks gave Lai Kê its rather frightening nickname, Rocket City. Uh, make a lot of memories, that's for sure. Uh. Uh, M16. Yeah, it looks like an M16 show. Sure is. Yeah. That's an M79 ammo. Yeah, that's M79. Like Randy, Robert has frightening memories of weathering a rocket yeah, attack. Being at Lai Kay brings them flooding back. 
Yeah, for a friend of mine. There in 1968, you know, during the Tet, they hit our compound, our trucks, our, our hooches. There was one rocket that came in. Well, it hit the, the hooch and it came sliding like this, and it didn't go off. And we were standing right there. One important objective has been achieved, but for years, Robert has had recurring nightmares about returning to Vietnam and searching for something he lost. What he lost was his baby brother, Felipe. Hello, I'm Randy's roommate. He's lucky to have me for a roommate. And my name is Kevin Fry, and I am from Newport, Rhode Island. One very important reason Randy Zahn came back to Vietnam is to honor his one-time best friend and roommate, Cobra pilot Kevin Mark Fry. It's Tuesday night, the 9th of June, 1970, and I have been here exactly three months and one week today. I'm counting the minutes now. Believe me, I don't like this place. And uh, we just got some incoming out here, and they tried to kill me again, but they missed again this time. And uh, you don't have to worry about your son, because as fast as I am, he beat me into the bunker. So uh, he, he, he just called him Twinkle Toes. When Randy made his audio tapes to send home, he always encouraged his friends to take part. Listening to the tapes years later with his wife, Kim, brought Vietnam back to Randy full force. And Kim was sitting there listening to this, and she was just hysterically laughing. I mean, it was, it was funny. And she looked at me, and I just had tears running down my face. And uh, she asked me, she stopped the tape, she said, what's the matter? And I said, Kevin's going to die in two weeks. Wow. It, was, it was like he was still alive. 25 years later, you hear his voice, and it all comes back. And I, I wanted so much to prevent it from happening, and I knew I couldn't. And it was just... a horrendously helpless feeling. So Randy and his comrades commit themselves to locating the very spot where Kevin's Cobra gunship crashed on July 28, 1970. I don't know. Well, we might have. As far as is known, Kevin's death was not due to enemy fire. His Cobra simply malfunctioned and crashed on a routine flight out of Phuc Vinh. We were out there flying around, and we got a call that there was a bird that had gone down. The difference this time is one of our Cobras is my roommate, Kevin Fry. I ran in and I said, where's, you know, where's Kevin? And finally he just turned around and I said, Randy, Kevin's not coming back. It was uh, an unbelievable feeling. I mean, it was just, I think I was, I was angry, I was sad, I was pissed off. I was incredibly sad. I didn't know what to do. I think I was probably in shock. Kevin's death impacts Randy not only because they were so close, but also because the morning he died, Kevin took the flight assignment, which was to have been Randy's. To be me. I think you blame yourself for part of that. No. For Kevin's death. Yeah, I do. I mean, it's... It, it, and Randy, you shouldn't. So together, Randy and the snake pilots seek out the site where Kevin crashed, in the remote jungles between Phuc Vinh and a hamlet known as Rang Rang. <laughs> The quest goes beyond the place where the buses can drive. So Randy, Brian, and the group continue on foot. The villagers all turn out for this impromptu parade. Some of the children have never seen a foreign face. The village elders know a hill which, if not the exact crash scene, is as close as one can come. Randy's tapes and Grover Wright's home movies combine to bring Kevin Fry back to life. <laughs> Hello, Randy's roommate reporting in again. And uh, we went flying today, taking all of you people back home. My roommate is dead. Yes, Kevin was killed in the crash yesterday, just because somebody screwed up. You want to just go, the three of us go over there just for a second? Yeah, we can. Okay, can you give us a minute? Absolutely. Okay, thanks.
Robert Hernandez looks forward with a mixture of excitement and dread. Soon, he will seek the spot where his brother Felipe was killed less than a year after Vietnam spared Robert's own life. Another member of Robert's support group, Boston native Stan Broda, didn't exactly volunteer to fight in Vietnam. Youthful hijinks brought him in contact with a judge who gave Stan a serious suggestion in the direction of the U.S. Navy. He joined the Mobile Riverine Force, the famed Brownwater Navy, and what he saw when he got to Vietnam made him grow up overnight. The thing that got me the most was when we would come in off an operation, uh, one of the ships was, uh, uh, they used it for um, bringing in body bags to evacuate the body bags and send them to wherever they sent them. The medevac helicopters would be dropping off the body bags on this one particular ship. That's what I remember the most. <laughs> All the members of the Corona support group deal in varying degrees with the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Their counselor, Thomas Buddy Hawkins, himself a Vietnam veteran, explains. Flashbacks or intrusive thoughts, uh, survivor's guilt, bad dreams, isolation. They avoided being close to their comrades because they didn't want to lose them. Consequently, they don't get close to anyone else. Already, Buddy can see that revisiting Vietnam and facing their pasts is having its healing effects on his clients. For Stan Broda, his mission boils down to one single errand with great symbolic significance. He was wounded at a river bend in the Mekong Delta, a place known as Snoopy's Nose, and he wants to go back there to leave his mark for himself and for his riverine force comrades. I brought this over with me. I thought it'd be a good idea because anybody that was uh, going up and down those rivers, uh, you, you probably remember the uh, Viet Cong flags. When we'd go up the river and we would see the Viet Cong flag nailed to the trees, it kind of screwed your head a little bit. So I'm gonna take this up uh, to Snoopy's nose and I'm gonna nail this to the tree just like the VC had their flags nailed to the tree for you guys. Even if Stan Broda wasn't exactly born to be a warrior, that can't be said about Leroy Huff. Gunnery Sergeant Huff fought a war which was very different from his fellow travelers. And now that he is back in Vietnam, he admits that in many ways, he has never stopped fighting it. Today, when I uh, uh, am, am in the States, I'm, I'm look around me to make sure that uh, no one's behind me. Wherever I go, I have to make sure that I know what's behind my back walking down the trail and stuff, I caught myself going back, looking from side to side, looking around me to make sure that I uh, didn't see any booby traps or people coming out of the grass. Leroy is a loner. He suffers from the isolation felt by many veterans. Perhaps more troubling is memory loss, blocks to his recollections of the war. This is significant considering he served four tours in Vietnam and is complicated by the fact that all of his personal memorabilia and photos were lost after his return. When Gunny's memories start to return, they come from visceral sources like taste, touch, and smell. Well, you can always smell the, the, the smell that's in the rice paddy. A lot of people that were lost, that were in my uh, squad, got shot. Some killed, never came back. I was 18 years old, and I would take point. We would walk on the dikes, spread apart the whole company. We would receive uh, maybe sniper fire from one of the villages, over, that village over there. Everybody would get down and try to assess what was going on. You were buried in that rice paddy just trying to, uh, to uh, get out of the way and not get hit. The leeches, the mud, or anything else like that, you just wanted to be... Uh, secure. It comes back when I'm here and start seeing things. I, with myself, I kind of try to drown that whole thing out and then gradually, now I'm gradually bringing it out and being open about it and coming here and see the rice paddies and stuff like this here brings back a lot of memories.
50 kilometers west of Fukvin rises Nui Ba Den, or Black Virgin Mountain. It stands sentinel over all of Western Three Corps. During the war, this commanding high ground was a much contested feature and landmark for the pilots, the VC, and everyone else. Pilots like Randy and Grover used to land on its top when it was a fortified U.S. command post. We owned the very top and we owned the very bottom and nothing in between. It was all owned and operated by the VC. Now, in peacetime, it is an anomaly, part amusement park and part religious shrine. The veterans gather on its high slopes, from which one can view almost all the terrain from Cambodia to Saigon. The external perspective lends itself to an inner perspective. We can stand here on this mountain and we can discuss about whether or not possession or the military aspect of this war is important. But the, the other part of this war history that has not been written are the people who live here. We don't know for sure what they felt like. We don't know for sure well, what, what kind of impact uh, this war had on them. And until we can combine both of those perspectives, we really won't know the history of this war. Robert Hernandez is now only miles from the site where his younger brother was killed. Robert's mission has become the whole group's mission. The spot they are seeking is called Bu Dap. It lies right on the border of Vietnam and Cambodia. It holds great significance for Randy, Brian, and Galen as their Cobra team staged raids from this location in 1970 to reach the NVA, where it was hiding in supposedly neutral Cambodia. Major Galen Rosher remembers his brief attempt at being a hot weapons pilot. Halfway between the tours, I tried to get in the gunships. My first mission in the guns I went out and we were over a convoy. The cardinal rule is when you're flying guns, you don't overfly the target because you'll die. So I made a pass. Well, maybe I'll just overfly a target a little bit. So I overflew the target, shooting, and everybody's shooting, and everybody's talking on the radio. And I said, boy, I'm glad to be in guns. This is where the action is. So I pulled collective aircraft yawed. I said, something's wrong. What had happened, I'd taken uh, some rounds into hydraulics. And at that point, I said, I'm going to have to crash right here. I'm going to be a POW. I thought of the, oh, my God. So we went down fighting the aircraft. We landed on a little knoll, got it down for some reason, and then it goes around like that and beats itself around, and we're OK. So we jump out of the aircraft. We get the machine guns out, set up a perimeter. And by that time, uh, the, uh, the rest of the gunships are over us. In about 10 minutes, they put in the aero rifle platoon, and they extracted us. and. Uh, I was saved. In August 1969, his brother Felipe was an everyday soldier working here, a supply clerk whose supporting role should have kept him safe from combat. It's probably the story of about 80% of the soldiers and Marines and airmen that served in, in Vietnam. This war was so multifaceted. There were no front lines. It could happen anywhere to anybody. He was a good kid, really good kid, so, and he's still a kid. Yeah, every picture I got, he's smiling. I've never seen him without a smile. Felipe was killed here, encamped on the red clay soil of Budap by an NVA mortar attack. If he was here, I could talk to him. I thought I'd come home. Miss you. Miss you a lot. I'm sorry you're gone. I wish it would really have been me.
great. Let's go home. The trip back south takes the travelers beyond the reach of roads, and they must abandon their buses for boats. Two of these veterans have waited a long time for a chance to see their Vietnam, the Mekong Delta. This 40,000 square kilometer bayou of islands, canals, tributaries, and swamps provided a trackless hiding place for the Viet Cong throughout the war. Water is not just in the river, it is everywhere. Traveling with Sandy Cochran is his friend John Decker of Kansas City, Missouri. They served together in the Go Devils of the 9th Infantry in 1969. Sandy was a career soldier, but John was a National Guardsman who happened to be called to active duty in the waning days of U.S. involvement. Is this tan true? Yeah, this is no? tan true. No, no, wait a minute. Here's a bridge. Come on, John. Think me. Here's a here's water. Think. Here's water. Unlike most of the travelers, these two men were officers. They had to command, protect, and motivate troops in some of the most arduous, foreign, and forbidding terrain imaginable against an elusive, often invisible enemy. After years of scholarship and researching the war for others, Sandy Cochran can finally look for his Vietnam. He has brought charts, records, and photos of his old headquarters at Tan Tru. On the clear morning of his return, Sandy's pace is suddenly that of the 30-year-old major who once trod this very ground. Where did they, can they find us on this piece of paper? Can they? Few remember the old American base here, but one man does. The camp was right over there. John, where the monuments are to the, uh, to the fallen patriots is where the, uh, is where the helipads were. Looking right here? Yeah. There's a steam bath right here. And I'm, I have this vision that right down there in that intersection here is where the, the road where, the, where the road bends is where the CP was. Ooh, yeah. Look, there's the moat. After 36 years and 10,000 miles, they are back. The best there has been. I mean, it's, the, it's the most likely. Yeah. Almost every area of Vietnam looks different today than it did in 1968. But the Delta is still the Delta. Here and there, a TV antenna rises from the deep jungled banks, and technology may appear in unexpected places. But life goes on here much as it has for centuries. Farmers bring their produce to market, the floating market where the rivers join. Hanoi and Washington might as well be on another planet. It was right here the once wayward Stan Broda, at the ripe old age of 19, exhibited heroism which earned him the Navy commendation with a combat V for valor. Stan's riverine unit was largely made up of kids like him. Rebellious and cocky, they patrolled the sinuous waterways, planting and removing mines and inserting special operations teams. They called themselves the River Rats. 
We went up and down the little tributaries in the Mekong Delta, and when they looked down at us, we always had helicopters flying cover for us, and uh, uh, we probably looked like little rats running up and down the river. We probably got the name River Rats from the, from the helicopter pilots. Traveling with Stan is the original River Rat, Bill Wedmore of Laguna Beach, California. Four years before Stan arrived, he commanded the same menacing Mike boats in the Delta's dangerous Rungsat Special Zone, a known Viet Cong stronghold. Bill was like a father to his young charges, and they loved him. I had the greatest group of coxswains. God, they were wonderful kids. Most of them uh, 17 to 19 years old, all of whom had been given the choice of going to jail or joining the Navy. But I'm telling you, once you gave them something to get their teeth into, like one of these boats, um, they were just terrific. For years, Bill kept silent about his Vietnam experience, preferring to put the war behind him. But when his own son James reached 21, the age Bill was when he fought, Bill decided it was time to revisit this long-buried part of his past and share it with his son. Knowing more about the war now and seeing my dad being able to, you know, lead a, a life afterwards gives me, I have a lot more respect and pride for him than I, than I did six days ago. So now Bill accompanies Stan as he sails in search of that bend in the river which marked his passage into manhood. Uh, really, I never thought this day would come. I thought maybe I would come to Vietnam, but I never thought I would get to do this trip. It's pretty awesome to come back and see this. It is also awesome for the other vet who remembers fighting here. A uh, thing we called a monitor, and it was a modified LCM with a lot of firepower and, and armor on it. And uh, the Marines were in my boats. We had it pretty well planned out. We'd take the deep side of the creek, so we'd go up the left-hand side of the creek, which was always the deepest. Yeah, uh, Stan could have been right standing beside me. I was involved in an operation that was probably one of the biggest operations ever held in the Mekong Delta. And I saw these boats going up that small tributary, and the radio just started going crazy, guys yelling, screaming. The boats that had gone up there two hours before got ambushed. With the confines of the river being so narrow, we couldn't turn around to get out of there. When we turned the corner, the 20 mile on the boat next to me just exploded. Big puff of black smoke, and all of a sudden, we started getting hit with rockets, small arms fire, and it just got crazy. So I would jump from machine gun to machine gun, and around hit the back of the boat, and knock me up against the side of the boat. And I got scared. At that time, the back of the boat was on fire. So I grabbed the boat hook, hooked the gas can, threw the gas cans over the side, put the fire out, went back in the well deck and said, I have another year of this stuff. I'm not going to make it home. When you get a bunch of vets together and they can hug and say, I love you, man, that's, that's pretty good, you know. These guys here, every one of them, I wouldn't mind being in a foxhole with. I left this country about 35 years ago. And then after we lost the war, and then I saw several veterans going back. And I always wondered in the back of my mind, what would it be like to go back to the country that I served for a year in? What would it be like after the takeover of the Communist Party? I got an opportunity, I came, I saw. It's been exciting, it's been emotional. Um, the country's completely different from what I remember it. The people are friendly, they're gracious, they're welcoming, they're warm, they're happy to see us. Um, they've virtually erased anything American, anything, any remnant of the war. I'm really surprised that even the airstrips are still there. Um, this has just been a great week. It's a memorable week. I, I'm not, I wasn't nearly as anxious to leave at this time as I was the first time. The veterans hope that someday, other soldiers will be able to experience what they have witnessed here. 
a beautiful country at peace. 